that the CFR clique that got us into Vietnam wrote the rules of engagement that made it impossible to win in Vietnam, you realize that what happened in Vietnam was not a quagmire or an accident. Well, what's the establishment agenda today? They're still promising us peace and prosperity. How are we going to get that? Well, the prosperity, they say, will come through multinational trade agreements, and the peace will come through their war on terror. Now, let's do, uh, do these individually. Now, as far as the trade goes, I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with these acronyms, North American Free Trade Agreement, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, World Trade Organization, Free Trade Area of the Americas, which is a plan to expand NAFTA to the entire Western Hemisphere, and Security and Prosperity Partnership, which is a plan for a North American Union Euro uh, in the style of the European Union. Now, you probably noticed something else, which is that jobs are disappearing in America. Our steel industry wiped out, textile industry wiped out, electronics industry wiped out. Where are all the jobs going? Not, not hard to figure out. They're going overseas, right? Why is that? I'll make it very simple. It used to be that a woman would go to Walmart, see two items, one made in America, one made in China. The one made in America would cost $5. The one from China, which had a tariff on it, would cost $4.50. And she'd say, well, the one uh, from China is a little cheaper, but the one in America is a lot nicer made. I'm going to buy the one made in America. But then we got into NAFTA, we got into the World Trade Organization, and what these did was to destroy, eradicate our tariff structure, being that now the same Chinese item comes in without a tariff on it, and now it costs only $1.50. But the American item still costs $5. What these trade agreements did was to flood us with cheap slave labor imports. The, the woman now goes to Walmart, she says, well, I like the one made in America, but I can't resist a bargain. I'm going to have to buy that one made in China. What happens, the American manufacturer now goes out of business, or has to uh, move his shop over to China. That has happened across every sector of industry here in America. Now, I taped the original hearings on the, the GATT Treaty in 1994, and at that time, senators swore up and down, you know, we're not going to increase the trade deficit as a result of this treaty. We're just going to export and import. It's going to flow both ways. Well, we passed the bill, uh, we ratified the treaty. The very next year, 1995, our trade deficit reached a new all-time high of $103 billion, and last year, $711 billion. The biggest item we're exporting these days is our jobs. Mm. Now, how many votes does America have in the World Trade Organization? Well, uh, when the GATT Treaty was passed, Europe got 30 votes, Africa got 35, and America got one vote. Our voting power is the same as the Maldives, population 200,000. What that means is these other countries can make the rules, keep our goods out of their countries while forcing us to accept theirs. But who pays for the World Trade Organization? That's right. American taxpayers pay the lion's share. They thought that was only fair. Well, America's founding fathers, you know what they would have called that? Taxation without representation. Who created the World Trade Organization? Now, do you think it was average Joes like you and me? Hey, Bob, you know, I think we ought to have our, our union with the Canadians and the Mexicans. Ralph, that's a swell idea. Let's tell our congressman about that. Do you think that's how our foreign policy originates? Do you think that we originated it? No. It's forced on us from above. Again, I taped the original hearings, and uh, at the time of the GATT Treaty hearings in Congress, uh, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Wall Street banker named Felix Ray Rohayton came down to testify on behalf of the treaty. He said that if America failed to ratify the treaty, he said the markets might react adversely. And I remember uh, Senator James Exxon of Nebraska was there, and he said, well, now, Mr. Rohayton, uh, we hear these dire economic predictions from you economists all the time. Nothing ever comes of them. Nothing ever comes of them, huh? That very same day, Alan Greenspan raised short-term interest rates 0.75%, a whopping increase which no one was expecting. As a result, the stock market started to plunge, and it tumbled for four straight days until finally, with everybody getting nervous, Bob Dole raced over to the White House, stood shoulder to shoulder with President Clinton, and said that the Congress would provide bipartisan support for the GATT Treaty, and it was passed, and the very next day, the stock market went back up. Senator Ernest Hollings, who chaired those hearings on the GATT Treaty, was very outspoken. Here's what he said on the floor of the Senate. They, referring to multinational corporations and banks, have got the Council on Foreign Relations up there in New York. 
If you ever run for president, they'll invite you. You can get out, you can get their contributions, you can get their support. I've been there, I know what I'm talking about. But that is what our friend David Rockefeller and all that got that steam together. It's not about jobs, it's about money. Well, they're getting rich and we're losing jobs. They're debilitating and destroying us. Well, I would take it even a step further than what Senator Hollings said. It's about more than money. It's about restructuring North America. What is the purpose of these international trade accords? Henry Kissinger, believe it, he's one of the big shots of the Council of Foreign Relations, said NAFTA will represent the most creative step towards a new world order taken by any group of countries since the end of the Cold War. And David Rockefeller, speaking of NAFTA, said, everything is in place after 500 years to build a true new world in the Western Hemisphere. Now this next man, Andrew Redding, you've probably been heard of, but I, the way he says this does much to elucidate what their plan is. NAFTA will signal the formation, however tentatively, of a new political unit, North America. With economic integration will come political integration. By whatever name, this is an incipient form of international government. Following the lead of the Europeans, North Americans should begin considering formation of a continental parliament. See what he's saying there, how economic consolidation will lead to political? Same thing happened in Europe. They started out with a common market, right? And they told the Europeans, all we want to do is create prosperity. We just want to knock down the tariffs and have free trade. But guess what? Then they said, look, uh, with all this trade going on, we need some common laws to regulate it. So they came up with the European Parliament. Now they've got the European Union. Now you've got your euro. Now your sovereignty is going down the drain. Same thing is planned for America. Now how about the war on terror? We're all against terrorism. 